Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the 30th Theological Conference. So we are almost at the end. Tomorrow we will wrap it up officially with Pastor Dennis Baldwin with his traditional Sunday sermon. But tonight, a man who really needs no introduction, but if you must have one, you can find one in the uh, presenters page, theologicalconference.org. And uh, many of you know uh, Sir Anthony Buzzard through his books. Uh, the first one published in the early 90s, Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity's Self-Inflicted Wound with uh, Charles Hunting, the late Charles Hunting. And uh, <clears throat> all right, so he is going to speak on a twisted pole and a rejected Jesus. So Anthony wears many hats. Among them, as you can see there, he was co-editor of a journal from the Radical Reformation, a very important journal. And you can see those articles on, on our website, focusonthekingdom.org as well. So before we get to him, though, let's see. Yes, we have a raffle. A No, sorry, not a raffle, a free draw, a drawing. So after the presentation, we'll do the draw for any book, Restoration Fellowship book. So if you win, and uh, I'll contact you if you win, and then I'll ask you which book would you like. And uh, all the books really are in print except one, Keegan Chandler's The God of Jesus. So that's out of print, unfortunately. So you can have the pick of any other books, though. So... All right, without further ado, mm -hmm. good evening, Anthony. Hi, Carlos. Thank you for that uh, nice introduction. And the rest of the work you've done over these three days has been very smooth and very easy. Thank you. Yes, so let's see. You have a paper. Yeah, I and do. I'll, I'll, I'll let people know after you, your presentation where yeah. to obtain the paper. But for now, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Take it away. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, the paper I will read. Uh, don't guarantee I might not throw in a few extra sentences here and there, but this paper will be available to you uh, for examination. I would encourage any of you listening to this conference that you don't get out of touch with us after the conference. If you have pressing questions, things where you think we haven't got the balance right, by all means, write to me at anthonybuzzard at mindspring.com. And what we do, and everybody does something, what we do in the grace of God is to deal with any possible biblical questions. We don't have all the answers, certainly not. We attempt to get this right. And so don't lose touch with us if we have said anything that is frustrating to you or difficult. By all means, track it down. And we'll try to engage you in, in email conversation. So with that in mind, the title is A Twisted Paul and a Rejected Jesus. I want to shock you a bit tonight, because we all become complacent very easily. But I want to suggest to you that there's a danger if you live in this American Bible system of embarking on a twisted Paul or rejected Jesus. And basically what I mean by that, separating Jesus from himself is very dangerous. Separating Paul from Jesus is equally dangerous. So what I'm proposing here is simplicity. Jesus and God did not intend the Bible to be so impossibly complicated. So that bear those things in mind as we go here. My appeal is that Unitarian believers take time. It's going to take meditation, deliberate meditation, consideration to verify that they've not drifted away from their own heritage. This can very easily happen when powerful new movements, even Unitarian ones, may I say, arise and exercise their persuasive power. I believe that the Unitarian people in the 1850s put their fingers on a fundamental flaw 
in popular versions of Christianity. The passage of time can almost inevitably lessen the clarity of that original, I'll call it Abrahamic discovery, Unitarian Abrahamic form of faith in the 1850s. We're all easily prone not to think critically. I include myself. We are lazy by instinct. We don't think critically, but we just go on along with the status quo if we're not careful. To summarize, we are faced with a potential rejection of Jesus and a twisting of Paul. It goes like this. Let me show you in a moment by quoting, and I'll do it in just very shortly, a famous dispensationalist. I want to thank Ken Laprade because he gave an answer to that question about dispensationalist. And it basically means cutting up the Bible, getting rid of, rid of books you don't like. It's a disaster. And then by citing, number two, a number of oddly neglected verses, which if preached and emphasized could eliminate the dispensationalist error and restore the truth. I remind you, it's only by having a passion for truth, Paul said, that we can hope to be saved. They're perishing. I'm quoting now, I'm paraphrasing 2 Thessalonians 2.10. People are perishing. Why? Because they don't have enough love? No, that might be true, but it's not what Paul said. People are perishing. It's a terrible condition to be in because they don't have a passion for truth in order to be saved. Uh-oh, that's striking. First, we need to reestablish clarity on this point about covenant. Covenant, very important word, covenant. The all-important covenant made with Abraham, I hope you know, is different from the later covenant made with Moses. Not the same thing. The covenant with Moses is not, I repeat, not the same as the covenant made with Abraham, and certainly not the same as the covenant made by Jesus. Major point, the covenant made by Moses is not the same as the covenant made by Jesus. If you haven't got that clear, you're in a big muddle, I want to tell you in a friendly manner. To show this, I remind you of Deuteronomy 5, 2 to 3. This verse, I think, established clearly that the Mosaic covenant made at Sinai or Horeb was not made with our fathers. That's what was written there. That covenant at Sinai was not made with our fathers, i.e. Abraham. Our faith must therefore have as its foundation, your faith, your Unitarian faith, must have as, as its foundation the promises made to Father Abraham, not the covenant made with Moses. True Christianity means having, isn't this a wonderful text, the faith of Abraham. Wow, that is a tremendously great ideal. Not the covenant made with Moses, the faith of Abraham, Romans 4.16. There it is, good refrigerator verse, which is also, by the way, the faith of Jesus. Not just faith in Jesus, rather badly translated in some of your translations. Faith in Jesus, I want to tell you, is too vague. What does it even mean? I want you to have faith in Jesus. Whoa, not much meaning. But the faith of Jesus means you need to sound and be like Jesus, the same faith as he had. So the biggest lies I go on here to say have the best chance of being believed. The biggest lies, too, can be what you don't say, what you leave out of your gospel story. And I want to show in a few moments some striking verses which have been left out in most discussions. A number of fundamentally important verses are just not reaching the public ear. The apostles and Jesus, with amazing foresight, they were vastly ahead of their time, Jesus and Paul and the apostles. They warned us against being deceived. These apostles were inspired to see what was coming. They knew what Satan, the Satan, that's the supernatural fallen angel, not human nature, I want to repeat. But the Satan had a plan, and the apostles saw what that was. And they warned us against being deceived. These apostles were inspired to see what was coming. They warned precisely and deliberately. So these two verses here in black, 1 Timothy 6, 3, 2 John 7 to 9, are utterly brilliant. They tell us all, and I hope you'll take this lesson away with you as you go home. The one thing you mustn't do is to lose the teaching, the teaching, the teaching of Jesus. 
these verses are not getting enough attention. They sound the alarm against any loss of the teaching of Jesus. Jesus was a rabbi, I want to tell you, a teacher. I want to do my best to help correct that threatening situation. My point is a simple one. The gospel preached by Jesus has been gutted of its major component and has kind of been replaced in the minds of most of your friends who are going to evangelical churches by a half gospel. The first element in the gospel, the kingdom, as Ken LaPrade said most eloquently, I thought, this afternoon, has been put out of sight. The gospel, as Jesus and Paul preach it, does not just offer a very important statement, does not just offer you forgiveness of sin, huge as that is, but forgiveness so that you may then go on to regain the status lost in Adam and thus find your true destiny. We are saved, I repeat here, not just by being forgiven, but in view of the great overarching Bible purpose as described in this verse, Jeremiah 27, 5. This is one of the grandest accounts of the gospel. God wants to give us, you, all of us Christians, the whole world. Have you taken that in? Did you know that you potentially own Scotland and Africa and Europe? Look at this verse. As I have made the earth by my great power, God said, and by my outstretched arm, I can give the earth to whoever I see fit to give it to. Wow. I don't hear much of that on popular evangelical programs. Jesus echoed this sentiment. He knew these verses well. Fear not, he said, little flock. Don't be scared. It is the Father's good pleasure. It's your Father's good pleasure. What he's thrilled to do, he's so delighted and excited about this. And his desire is to give you the kingdom. What? Have you sat, sat down and thought about what does that mean? This is exactly repeated in Romans 4.13, which reads as follows. The promise to Abraham and to his descendants, his seed, is that he, Abraham, would have the world as his inheritance. Christians, as you probably know, I hope you know, are defined by Paul as the seed of Abraham. So if you're claiming to be a believer, a true Christian, you are the seed of Abraham. And the promise to you is that you would have the world as your inheritance. Now, I remind you of these words from an Archbishop of Canterbury, and I could multiply these quotations, but I won't, about the astonishing, I mean, amazing absence of the gospel of the kingdom during all of church history. Absence of the gospel of the kingdom means absence of Jesus and thus absence of Christianity. The Archbishop wrote this, and please allow, allow for his tendency to British understatement. I mean, you can, you can put a whole lot of exclamation points in what he writes to make it sound more exciting. He says this, an Archbishop of Canterbury, no fool, he knew his church history. Every generation finds something in the gospel which is of special importance to itself and seems to have been overlooked in the previous age or sometimes in all the previous ages of the church. Imagine that. The great discovery, the archbishop said, of the age in which we live, the 1900s was when this was written, is the immense prominence, underline, immense prominence given in the gospel to the what? Kingdom of God. To us, the Archbishop wrote, it is quite extraordinary, put a few exclamation points after that, that the kingdom of God figures so little in the theology and religious writings of almost the entire period of Christian history. Certainly in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the kingdom of God gospel has a prominence that could hardly be increased. That's an amazing statement. You remember that we, my, my wife and I, are really only in America at all because we found people here who didn't throw us out when we said, look, the gospel is about the kingdom. So in this, our 30th year, 
of presenting reflections on the current state of affairs among the kingdom Unitarian people, my sense is that a serious division has arisen among us affecting the very heart of the teaching of Jesus himself. I start by pointing out that you're living in a Bible atmosphere in America, which does not, I repeat, not take the gospel of Jesus, the gospel preached by Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom, anything like as seriously or precisely as our Bible documents. Let's put this little matter to the test. All of you listening are probably quite convinced that the gospel of the kingdom was the heart of Jesus' business. To test yourself on that point, is anyone in our audience this evening doubtful about Luke 4.43? That's the verse which supplies and provides Jesus' own mission statement. Wouldn't you like to have that one? You would think that this ought to be basic for every believer. A grand John 3.16, if you like. But the fact is, not so. You won't find tracts and books on salvation, thousands of them. You won't find them even talk about Luke 4.43. Rick Warren's purpose-driven church doesn't even mention it. If I can't shock you with that sort of information, I don't know what would shock you. Likewise, if you happen to have been touched by the theo theology of so-called dispensationalism, and I'm going to define that uh, to back up what Ken LaPrade was saying, you will have been taught, get this, that the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel for you today. Wow. I repeat, that's what dispensationalism, which is very widely spread in your evangelical churches, is not. The gospel of the kingdom, they say, is not, not, not the gospel for you today. I quote one example from the 21st chapter of Terence Larkin's book, his commentary on Daniel. Now, please grasp this idea of dispensationalism and how very evil and dangerous it is. Larkin rightly states that the gospel of the kingdom was preached by Jesus and the apostles, but then he says this. Larkin maintains that this gospel of the kingdom was only for Jews. And then he goes on to say, when the Jews generally fused, refused that gospel of the kingdom, then he says, that gospel of the kingdom ceased. What? And it was replaced by what Larkin calls the gospel of the grace of God. That is a colossal lie that's going to leave a whole lot of people very disappointed when Jesus comes back. I say this is an astonishing systematic error calculated, I think, is page three available there, Carlos? Page three of my paper. There we go. I think it's calculated to invite the chilling words of Jesus when he said that only those who hear and do what he says, what he teaches, can hope to qualify the kingdom and salvation. Here are the complete words of Larkin on the gospel. I want to really rub this in for you. Now you're going to hear what dispensationalism is, and I hope you're going to be horrified. So Larkin says here, I'm quoting, the word gospel means good news, good stuff. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news that God is going to set up a kingdom of the earth over which David's son Jesus will reign, Luke 1, 32, 33. And I hope you're saying hallelujah. Oh, read on. This gospel, says Larkin, the dispensationalist, was proclaimed by John the Baptist and Jesus and his disciples in the words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, same thing, is at hand. The call to repent was not to individuals, but the nation. Well, it was for everybody, in fact, I would add. The nation, says Larkin, the dispensationalist, refused, the nation refused, he says, and rejected the king and crucified him. But before the king's death, the gospel of the kingdom, which up to that time had been preached only in Palestine and not in all the world, was withdrawn. This dear man with his degrees in theology, he's an author of books, he's telling you now that the gospel of the kingdom was withdrawn. Then he says it's going to be preached again after the church has been caught out. That'd be a preacher of rapture that, as you know, we're against following traces. Good description this morning. And then he says, 
it's going to be preached again after the church has been raptured out before the tribulation. Then you can have the kingdom of God gospel. But right now, it is not the gospel of the kingdom which matters for you. And then he says in that future time, it's a call to Israel as a nation to repent and that Christ is coming to set up the stone kingdom or millennial kingdom. So then dispensationalism, Larkin says further, which is widespread in evangelicalism, how true, teaches then that between the two preachings of the gospel of the kingdom, one in the past and one in the future, he says, we have the preaching of a different gospel called the gospel of the grace of God. My goodness. It's the proclamation, says Larkin, of salvation through faith in the death of Jesus, the atoning sacrifice. That's a quote, deliberate quote from Reverend Clarence Larkin, author of the, what the book calls itself, the great book on dispensationalist truth. I hope you've got that idea very clear, and I hope you're revolted by it, scared by it, and running a million miles from it. I remind you of Jesus' words. Multitudes will say to me on that future day, Lord, Lord, look what we did by way of preaching for you and even doing miracles for you. Jesus' response is simply that, that they had not laid the foundation of sound teaching by making his kingdom gospel the heart and center of everything preached. Jesus was warning about Christian failure in the very context of his call that we are to beware of false prophets. That means be scared of them. Watch out. How do you know you haven't got a false prophet preaching to you every Sunday? I hope you're checking that carefully. So, next section, in favor of beautiful truth. I was thrilled recently to find in the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges, stating in Hebrews 2, that this wonderful quote, Jesus was the first preacher of his own gospel. I wish you'd put that on the fridge. Jesus was the first preacher of his own gospel. <coughs> there it is, Mark 1.14. This is superbly true, I say. But the Billy Graham system insists that, quote, Jesus came to do three days' work, to die, to be buried, and to rise from death. Did you hear that? That's Billy Graham, very famous. <coughs> That's his definition. Three days' work. That definition, I say, eliminates a major neglected text, which I argue can bring us all back on track. That is Mark 1.1, 1, 1, <coughs> which brilliantly states that the subject of Mark's writing, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, marvelous verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. I think Joe would do a few hallelujahs on that one. Not the middle, not the end, not one part of it, but the beginning of the gospel as Jesus preached it. The definition of that gospel is then provided in Mark. Mark was a very clever writer, probably reflecting Peter, by the way. These are very systematic, careful teachers and writers. The gospel is called God's gospel. Wow! You'll find eight other occurrences. Look them up with your software if you can uniting other verses to that same God's gospel. Excellent phrase. God only has one gospel. We cannot afford to get that gospel wrong for the peril of losing our own success. So please look those up sometime. Let's go to page four, if we can, Carlos, thank you. There it is, gospel of God, God's gospel. It actually frames the book of uh, Romans, we like to say frames it. Paul had it in Romans 1 and Romans 16. That's brilliant, Paul. These writers are trying to teach us, if we'll let them teach us. It's God's gospel about the kingdom. So when we speak of the gospel to our friends, as we should all the time, as we have opportunity, there's no better place to begin, I say, than Mark 1.1, 1, 1, beginning. But you'll not find this passage in any tract offering salvation. Nor, astonishingly, will you find Acts 20, verse 24, followed by verse 25. Ken LaPrada is very thrilled, mentioned this too. In Acts 20, verse 24, and the following verse 25, these two verses provide a marvelous 
definition of what Paul preached as the gospel. I remind you that in Acts 20, verse 24, Paul summarized his whole Christian preaching, his whole career, by saying that he had what? Preached the gospel of the grace of God. Wonderful. Now ask your friends politely and respectfully what the next verse says. I don't think they will know. Verse 25, which is carefully avoided, I mean avoided. I know this because I've looked at hundreds of tracts. They're not going to give you this verse because it defines what the gospel of the grace of God is. Paul defines that gospel of the grace of God as his own preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. That is brilliant, Luke, who wrote that. Luke. That puts Paul in touch with his own gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. It immediately reunites, reattaches Paul to Jesus. You see how beautiful this is. But it's avoided in evangelical literature. Paul defines that gospel of grace as his own preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Paul sounds just like Jesus. We want that. The simplicity of the faith, of the faith. Paul and Jesus are saying the same gospel, announcing the same gospel. At one sense, sanity is restored to the whole New Testament gospel. Your friends are going to thank you for this. We get very kind and generous letters all the time from people who are seeing this makes really good sense of the New Testament and the Bible. Jesus, therefore, and Paul have to be reconnected. That Acts 20, verses 24, 25, is going to do that. I suggest there's a concerted effort in much of evangelicalism, the Billy Graham system, to keep that simple, fatal detachment of Jesus and Paul out of sight. They're not going to love those verses. Oh, no. Error, I want to tell you, is aggressive. They're going to work at getting this wrong. God is their judge, but our job is is to point out the simplicity of truth. So, the, so there are different ways, I say, of avoiding the truth about the gospel. Dispensationalism of the Larkin type, I just gave you the quote, simply announces that the gospel of the kingdom ceased when the Jews rejected it. But that it will be resumed, the gospel of the kingdom, only after the imaginary pre-trib rapture. That dispensationalism therefore forbids you. Notice this is from religious colleges, from pastors in pulpits, forbids you effectively from obeying the opening command of Jesus. Salvation is all about obedience, 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 the obedience of faith. You can't earn your salvation, but you better obey or else, right? First command of Jesus in Mark 1.14 is repent. That's a command. Change your mind and begin to believe the gospel of the kingdom. You want to do that, then you're beginning to sound like Jesus. But evangelicalism, probably your local evangelical church, is going to be against that. Salvation is by obedience to Jesus. That's a terrific text, Hebrews 5, 9. And here in Mark 1, 14 is Jesus' first command. So I think it's time for us to remind ourselves that the Jesus story is the story of the whole Bible and it's a Jewish story. It's not a British story. It's not an American story. The very first thing said about Jesus, you tell your friends, is that the Lord God, that is, will give Jesus the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Israel, and his kingdom will be endless. There's the whole story. Do your friends know those verses? You know what the Queen of England rules over the United Kingdom. Do we argue about that? Do we think her throne is in, in, in heaven? Of course not. Jesus is going to inherit the sure mercies of David. Wonderful phrase. The covenantal promises of David. This is called the new covenant, not the covenant made with Moses. Now, some personal reflections here. I certainly could not have known any of this in the first 20 years of my Church of England experience. I'm not lying to you. I was there. Why would I bother lying? The kingdom of God is the heart and the center of the new, not the old Mosaic covenant. In Jeremiah 33, 20, 21, God made his point with ultimate emphasis. If you can alter my covenant with day and night, in other words, if you can change the repetition of day and night, 24-hour period, then 
you can alter my covenant with David. Isn't that a marvelous way of saying, you better watch this. As sure as the sun gets up in the morning, as sure as the sun sets in the evening, my covenant with David is never going to cease. And David will ultimately have a king ruling on his throne. You can go to Jerusalem today and you won't find Jesus ruling there. That then points to the parousia, the second coming. He must come back for that covenant promise to be true. That is the gospel too, all about the covenant with David. If you lose that, you lose the gospel and you lose Christianity. If we are not teaching with complete clarity, the fact that the new covenant is like the covenant about the kingdom of God, we're missing out on a great deal. Thus in Luke 20, 29, note the translation correctly there, Jesus stated that he was covenanting, not just giving. The word there is covenanting his disciples a kingdom. Doesn't that sound awfully like, fear not little flock to your father's good pleasure to give you by covenant. This is the new covenant, the gift of the kingdom. He promised it to Jesus and he promises it to you. To say then that this kingdom covenant belongs in the Old Testament is a way, to use a current political term, of canceling Jesus. Something we must never risk doing. So here's what's happened. Evangelicalism has rightly stressed that the death of Jesus results in being forgiven for our sins. Correct. But the gospel did not begin with the death of Jesus. The great fact which is so desperately missing from popular preaching is that Jesus and God's intention is to give us the kingdom. Fear not, little flock, your father is delighted to give you the kingdom. And that kingdom was defined with clarity to Abraham. The promise was to Abraham and his seed, his descendants, which is us, that he would be heir of the entire world. Have you taken that in? Did you know you were heir to Iceland and France and Germany? Ponder that. Not the universe, but the world as created for man. It was precisely this, which remember that Adam lost. And so Jesus is so smart. How does he reverse that loss of the kingdom to Adam? By saying, repent and believe in the kingdom. Let's get right what Adam got wrong. Now the story is beginning to, to cohere. Now please note that there's an extant Unitarian translation of the Bible. Note this now. I want you to be shocked to your core. There's an extant Unitarian translation of the Bible which states, one, that the four Gospels really belong in the Old Testament. What? And two, I quote from this Unitarian translation, there's no reason to baptize in water today. That is a falsehood. We've preached against that and in favor of water baptism as simple obedience all of the years of the theological conference. Now, in these early teenage years of Jesus, I suggest, as he searched the scriptures daily, he found his own career in them, the career of the one designated by God, to restore law and order, desperate and needed in America today, peace and security, the abolition of all hostility, hostility between nations. Jesus had read in his Bible, his Hebrew Bible, and he comes to us as kind of Mozart of biblical exposition that God was going to plant or sow a new people. Of course, that was God's intention to plant people like you plant seeds. I will plant my people in the land, Hosea 2.23 and other verses. Yes, God was going to sow them. It follows, of course, that Jesus spoke primarily and always of the parable of the sower, where the saving gospel message itself is defined as the gospel message about the kingdom, Matthew 13.19, Matthew 13.19, Matthew 13.19. If you lose track of that basic fact, then you've lost the foundation of the Christian faith and you risk building on sand. Evangelical tracts offering salvation have not a word you'll find to say about the parable of the sower. Why is it then that everybody knows you must be born again to be saved? They all know that in John 3. But almost nobody tells you that being born again can only happen when you're exposed to the seed gospel 
which was preached to you as gospel, the seed of immortality, which preached to you was preached to you as gospel. So never ever touch John 3 until you also do 1 Peter 20, 1 Peter 2, not 1 Peter 22, that's a typo. 1 Peter 2, verses 23 to 25. So there's a misprint there. Okay, next page. We're getting towards the end here. All right. Yes, there it is. It should be 1 Peter 2, not 22. What has happened is this, that the Christian future, i.e. hope, on which Paul said faith and love depend. Are you short of faith and love? Maybe you don't have much hope. Strengthen your hope and faith and love depend on that hope. It's been reduced and canceled and replaced by the awful going to heaven stuff when you die. To do who knows what. Jesus was of the opposite opinion. How blessed are the meek. They're going to have the earth or the land or the world as their inheritance. Quoting from Psalm 37. And in Romans 38, 32, what about this one? How much more will God give to us and to Jesus everything? How would you like to have everything is your inheritance? Did you grasp that God wants to give you the world as your inheritance? The International Critical Commentary, much good stuff in some of these commentaries, but the public doesn't get to read them. Jews, as vassals of a legal system, do not qualify as true believers, according to Paul. As one of the descendants of Abraham, Abraham's seed was to enjoy worldwide dominion. Tell your children that. You are Abraham's seed. This faith righteousness, being right by faith, which Paul described as characteristic of the true Christian and before him of Abraham, is the right to universal dominion. I didn't write this from the standard commentary, which will belong to Messiah and his people. If the right to universal dominion, which will belong to the Messiah and his people, is confined to those who are subject to the law of Moses, what can it have to do either with the promise originally given to Abraham? This is the whole argument of Galatians. Very, very good statement. So Abraham was promised the inheritance of the world and his seed, which is you. Okay, final page coming. If these promises belonged to the law of Moses, then they would be pushed aside and canceled altogether. Don't you ever say, please, that Jesus was a model of the Old Covenant. That's pushing Jesus back into the Old Testament, getting rid of him. That would be the ultimate Christian failure. Please make sure you know that Jesus was, I quote again from the Cambridge Bible from schools, that Jesus was the first preacher of his own gospel. Wonderful. He was the first preacher of his own New Covenant gospel. But Jesus is not a warmed over copy of Moses. On no account be guilt of guilty of canceling Jesus in the name of a twisted Paul. By no means should you say that Jesus is a model of the old covenant. Don't do that. That would be the worst form of being out of date. The Torah of Messiah is not, I repeat, the Torah of Moses. And Paul labored in the book of Galatians which we in Armstrong days, those old Jewish roots days, uh, we didn't deal with the book of Galatians. Paul is willing in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 to 21, to do Moses-like things when in the company of Jews who are not under the law. Sorry, who are under the law. I repeat that. Paul is willing in 1 Corinthians 9 to do Moses-like things when in the company of Jews who are under the law of Moses in order to win them. I'll keep the Sabbath with you in Israel if that pleases you and helps me to win you for Christ. Paul, speaking for Jesus, is himself not under that Mosaic law, but rather within the Torah of Messiah, a huge difference which should never be fiddled with and pleaded against in the name of false pretended knowledge of the Greek. To preserve the Abrahamic faith, the faith of Abraham intact, these truths must be struggled for. And I think that's the end of where we are. And that word struggled makes me finish with this. Evangelicalism often says 
The gospel is, is pure grace, no struggle. No struggle. What? The gospel is grace. It's the same as the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus said, struggle, agonize to get in by the narrow gate. What do you mean there's no struggle in the gospel? There's a huge struggle in the gospel, which is the gracious offer of God and Jesus to you that you would own the entire world and help to supervise it with Jesus. Thank you. Okay. All right. Wow. Thank you, Anthony. That was mm -hmm. great as usual. Uh, let's right. see. Yeah. So we're going to <clears throat> give some time for questions. If you have any questions, yeah. please type them in now. While they do that, Anthony, I will I will tell people about the papers from the presenters. So if you are, let's go back to the theological conference site uh, while we wait for questions. So go to presenters, as you see there. And then if you scroll down at the bottom of this page, so keep scrolling, moving down, you'll see that, papers. And please note the disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in some of these presentations are those of the authors only and do not necessarily reflect the beliefs of Restoration Fellowship. Obviously, Anthony's paper does <laughs> because he's the founder. So click on that folder you see there, and it should take you to the same disclaimer. <laughs> I guess the disclaimer is important. And there you go. There are the uh, papers, actually papers going back to 2003. So this is, again, the 30th conference. Unfortunately, we don't have all the papers from the last 30 years. I wish we did, but uh, all right. So you go up to 2021. By the way, thanks to our webmaster, Alex Davila, Pastor Alex Davila in Nicaragua. He All the stuff you see here, this is not my doing, by the way. I wish but uh, we have a true webmaster and uh, he's very good as you can see so thank you alex pastor alex in nicaragua please by the way pray for him latin america getting hit very hard by the pandemic and the economic disparity going on all right so on the left there you see you click on anthony and that should pop up as a pdf so you can download it please share it uh, copy it, paste it, whatever. Just get it out there, as we always say. The problem really is getting all the stuff out there. I mean, we have almost hundreds of years combined of, of materials. So, uh, yes. Uh, and then, so not all the presenters, as you can see, have papers. So it's not like a requirement of presenters. We don't require it. So this year, so far, we have Anthony's, Ken, um, my paper, and Tracy's. By the way, I will present my paper tomorrow morning. And uh, just to remind you of that, go to the home page of this same website, and there's the schedule. So we're ending today with Sir Anthony. By the way, we have the free draw coming up, so stay tuned. And then tomorrow we have a couple of faith stories and then my sermonette. And then uh, Pastor Dennis Baldwin closes out with the, uh, the uh, usual Sunday service. And then Sir Anthony will come back and do communion. So if you'd like to partake of communion, uh, you're free to do so. All right. So, Anthony, there's a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Let's see. The law of Moses was until John the Baptist mm. began preaching, Luke mm -hmm. 16, 16, correct? Absolutely. That's a brilliant shift point. John the Baptist, who introduced Jesus, who was the greatest man 
Jesus said, who had lived up to that point at least. And he is the one who begins this new gospel of the kingdom preaching. Luke 16, 16 is a staggeringly important uh, comment on the timetable, which we're talking about. Yes. All yeah. right. Um, next question. Is it a sin to keep the Sabbath? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. If you want to take upon you the sign of the old covenant, do it. But I don't recommend it. Why would you want to have the sign of the old covenant, which is the Sabbath? Why would you want that? So I can only invite you to re-examine that, especially in the light of Colossians 2.16, where Paul clearly said that the whole calendar, annual, monthly, that's the new moons, weekly Sabbath, it's a shadow. And it's been negatively contrasted there with Jesus, who's the reality. So the soma to Christu, I'm giving the Greek there because it's so clear. Those things are only a shadow. Now, if your conscience requires you to keep the Sabbath, you should until you've investigated it further, by all means. If your conscience is killing you, if you go to work on Sabbath, then I think you haven't understood this yet. But I would only invite you to do what we did. And I was there for 14 years as a Sabbath keeper. And I believe that was in the Ten Commandments, so it must be valid forever. Now I know better. I've read Galatians. So... It's a question of conscience, and God knows your heart. So is it a sin? It depends on where you are in your understanding. I'd only recommend that you get beyond that sign of the weekly Sabbath. Come clear into the light of the new covenant. I think you will actually feel better. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question about this text. Uh, can you comment on what Paul says in Romans seven twelve? He said, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he's, he's talking about the law there. And you have to define what Paul means by the law in every case. As a general statement, he's simply saying the Old Testament is God's material. The law is holy. The commandment was holy. All of it was right and good. That's only part of the story, though. He later goes on to di distinguish between the law of Messiah and the law of Moses. So in the context of Romans 7, uh, Romans 7, 12, it stands absolutely true. Psalm 119 is full of it. Oh, I love your law. Of course, we should love the law of God. But you do need to define what law you're talking about. If you're talking about the law of physical circumcision in Genesis 17, then all the males must be circumcised physically. That's what it says. You must insist on that. Jew and Gentile, anybody who wants to be in the covenant who's male, must be circumcised. Is that what Paul taught? Obviously not. So there's been a radical shift, change in terms of law. So it's no good taking one verse and working out of that entirely without looking at the entire question. But it's a, it's a great question, nevertheless. So the law there is, is a reference... If you remember the context there, is, yep. is he talking about the law of Moses, Paul, there? Uh, he's talking about the law as, uh, the, yeah, for him, the law of Moses would certainly be what he's referring to, just basically the Old Testament, I think. I've forgotten without reading the context precisely. But he's pointing out to a Jew that if you're claiming to be keeping the law, you better be keeping it. Because a real Jew is the one who is inwardly spiritual. He's not yet getting into the other question of what part of the law of Moses the Christian church has to keep. That's a separate issue. Deals with that in Galatians entirely. So it's a, it's a good question, but ponder and analyze those things a lot. In Romans 7, 12, I'm reading this. So then, brothers, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh absolutely we're not to live following our human sinful passions this is is this romans 12 yes are you unaware brothers let me read this uh, i'm speaking Ro no. romans 7 and romans 7 yes seven. romans 7 and verse 12. yeah it's a, yes at the okay. bottom, he, he says uh um, yep. uh he's yep. talking about being released from the law mm -hmm. 
he says in verse 6, now we're released from the law, dead to what held us captive. Mm -hmm. And then he says, what, what then can we say, that the law is sin? Of course not. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing, yeah, it's the law of Moses, because he goes on to say, um, I did not know what it is to covet, except that the law said, mm -hmm. you shall not covet. Yep. Uh, so I think he's referring to the law of Moses. Yes, yes they would then, be hearing the law of Moses there. Yeah. That's right. But he that's not the entire story because in Galatians, there's part of the law, the part which de deals with calendar, with food laws, with physical circumcision, where he says, don't go near it. That distinction must be made. All right. Uh, let's see. One couple more. If anyone has any other questions. Yeah. Uh, this is from Joe Martin. Jesus gospel, the kingdom of God, and Jesus Creed, the Shema. What yep. a great combination. Do you see us as doing Matthew 24, 14? Yeah, I, I think we're part of that. I, I don't know if there might be a fuller uh, occurrence of that in the future. I don't know exactly, but I don't think this is a, a prophecy of angels preaching it just before Christ comes back. This gospel, the kingdom we preach, I would love to feel, and I think we are playing a part in that. And I say that because God, I think, has led us into this. We didn't choose to do all this. I didn't set out with any of this in mind, but God has given us this compulsion to see that the gospel about inheriting the world is the gospel, and it will be preached throughout the whole world. It can now be done uniquely because of the miracle of Internet. That I'm sure of. So, yes, it's a very exciting time to be lived in. Um, yep. Let's see. Is it, isn't it healthy to be circumcised without attaching anything spiritual? That's a purely medical medical question. If you don't do think of anything to do other than medically, fine. If your doctor says that's the way to be, but Paul doesn't believe that because he says if you are uncircumcised, do not get circumcised. So Paul knew nothing of any medical benefit. So that's a matter for you and your doctor. But certainly, once you turn that into some right or wrong, spiritually speaking, you are either obeying God. And there are some Unitarians who are saying in order to obey God, if you're a male, you must be physically circumcised. That's absolutely false. So it would be a question then of what your doctor would say if you're talking about medical reasons. Good question. Um, just to go back to your paper. Yeah. Anthony, I, yeah. I have a comment here about yeah. uh, this um, Larkin, is it? Yes. Uh, let's see. Larkin's, uh, he says that Christ, Christ is coming to set up the stone mm -hmm. or millennial kingdom. Yes, true. I've never heard it or I've never read or heard it put this way. Mm hmm that the kingdom is the stone. Now that's from that vision. Yes, it is the stone, right, the food, two. yes. Uh, you, yep. Let me read those verses for mm -hmm. the audience here. Yeah. I just found that interesting the way this, right, uh, this mm -hmm. uh, Larkin put it. So Daniel 2 says, Yes. While you watched, a stone was hewn from a mountain without a hand being put to it, and it mm -hmm. struck its iron and clay feet. This is that statue. Mm -hmm breaking them in pieces, the iron, clay, bronze, silver, gold, all crumbled at once, mm -hmm. fine as the shaft on the threshing floor in summer. And yes. the wind blew them away without leaving a trace. But the stone that struck the statue mm -hmm. became a great mountain yep. and filled the whole earth. That's right. And then he quotes uh, later in the chapter, mm -hmm. in the lifetime of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed or delivered up to a, another people. Rather, it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms yep. and put an end to them, and it shall stand forever. Absolutely. That is the meaning of the stone. So yes. That's the stone lark in the it's the gospel of the kingdom, and he believes in that, but not for you. That's only right. to be preached to Jews. He's got the kingdom of God definition right, but then he takes away what he's just given by saying that's only for Jews and not for you. Right. Yeah. It's just an interesting uh, yep. way to put it that Christ 
is coming to set up the stone. Yeah. And I guess that is. Well, I didn't. True. Maybe I should put that slightly different. The stone is simply the kingdom of God, which is going to smash and crush all the previous pagan kingdoms. That's all that is. Referred to in the New Testament. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So keep in touch. Keep in touch. Thank you. So we will now uh, wrap things up for this evening with the draw, the free draw. So everyone sent in who wanted to be part of it, sent in their names. And now we will spin the wheel of fortune. No, the, uh, <laughs> the wheel of the free draw. So let me bring it up. So we will do, actually, we had a, lo a lot of names. So I, for re uh, personal private reasons, I do not put the name as you see, the full name, just the initials. So we will do three spins of the wheel. And um, so if your name comes up, you will have the chance to request any book published by Restoration Fellowship, except, unfortunately, Keegan's The God of Jesus book, as I have said, that book is out of print. So apologies for that. But any other book in the RF bookstore is yours. So, all right, I have the names and you see the initials. If everyone's ready, we will do the first draw of the evening. So let me set this up. And here we go. Oh, hold on a sec. Uh, let me try this again. And okay, let's see if this works. <coughs> All right, NS, NS, so I'll highlight NS as the first winner. Again, I will contact you afterwards. I know who you are. I hope you know who you are from the initials. So congratulations to NS. All right, so we will spin again. So three turns to the wheel of, of free books here. All right, CSS. Let's see who's CSS. All right, I got you. I hope you know who you are, CSS. Congratulations. So once again, you get a pick, a free pick of any of our books. Again, this is free, folks. And uh, I know some of you would like to pay and, and things like that, but these are free draws. So, but we appreciate your sentiments. And okay, the last spin oh by the way i should say if it happens to land on the same person we'll spin again so you know it's a bit unfair if it lands on the same one so all right here we go <laughs> rp boy that was a close one Let's see, who is RP? Okay, I got RP. All right, congratulations to NS, CSS, and RP. Again, you get a, a pick of the books, and I'll show you some of the books that are in the RF bookstore. If you go to our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org, Click on books. So you get to choose. You can have Sir Anthony's latest 
public uh, publication, the New Testament with commentary, second edition, by the way, already sold out of the first edition. So this is the second. And um, actually, Anthony will actually, well, hold on, let me bring bring up Anthony. That's fine. Yeah, Anthony, and and you'll you'll sign the books for the. People. Oh yeah, that's a great honor. I'd be honored to sign it as clearly as I can. All right. <laughs> Okay, so Sir Anthony will sign them. So, all right, so that's, uh, you can have the amazing names and claims. Actually, let me put the link in the chat. But anyway, when I email you, if you're watching and you know who you are, you can go to that link and check out the selection. We have the amazing claims, the coming kingdom of the Messiah, probably my, my favorite in the collection here. And this one is out of print. I know a lot of people request Keegan's excellent tome. And it's a hefty tome. I think it's, what is it, 300, 400 pages. So it's very massive work, but very uh, influential. Uh, let's see. And pretty much the rest are available. So our fathers who are not in heaven. And Greg Dybul. They never told me this in church. So any of those books, I'll be contacting you soon and you let me know which books you would like. All right. So thank you, Sir Anthony. Thanks to all the presenters. Tomorrow we will once again wrap up things up. So there's the schedule once again. Uh, we finish tomorrow officially. We start at 9, 9 a.m. We'll do a couple more faith stories. I hope you're enjoying those. And, uh, yep, a couple of faith stories. Then I'll do a little sermonette. Uh, some of you who follow us regularly, online church, know this. Uh, I do this little sermonette. And then we will get to the main sermon from Pastor Dennis Baldwin. And then communion, communion with uh, Sir Anthony. We, we included communion there. All right, so thanks again, folks. And we will close with prayer as usual. Thanks for tuning in live. And uh, let's close with prayer. Father, we... Thank you once again for this time, for all the presenters, for Sir Anthony's longevity and passion for the, for the truth, the gospel of the kingdom and the things regarding Jesus. Father, we pray for everyone around the world during this difficult time in history with this recent pandemic and economic turmoil. We uh, ask you to bless those less fortunate than us we are so fortunate to live in in countries of freedom and we're able to get together like this unhindered and without any fear we thank you for this incredible gospel about the kingdom that amazing people like the prophet daniel jeremiah and others uh, were faithful to to pass on um so we ask you, Father, to keep blessing this conference 30 years. Thank you for giving us all this time to do this until the kingdom comes. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, folks. So we'll see you bright and early tomorrow at 9 a.m. That's Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. So God bless. And until we meet again.